Boa noite a todos. É com grande prazer que inicio a abertura do nosso quarto webinar. Meu nome é Elaine Claire, sou doutoranda de genética e melhoramento da UFV e membro do Gen Melhor, responsável pela coordenação de divulgação. Nesse nosso quarto webinar de 2021, contaremos com a presença do Head of Soybean Product Designer da Bayer, Michael Kovac, que falará sobre os três for modern crop improvement involve how we think and how we work to enhance sustainable crop production. Michael impulsionou a organização e tem dirigido a Bayer no sentido de desenvolver e lançar rapidamente novas tecnologias que acelerem a entrega e o desempenho inovador para os produtos em todo o mundo. Sua experiência técnica é baseada em genética e melhoramento, na qual aplica mais de uma década, compreendendo que o produto do sucesso ele requer um entendimento profundo das necessidades dos nossos produtores. Michael desafia equipes a implantar produtos e pacotes de dados que irão maximizar o sucesso em cada hectare. Michael é apaixonado por liderar com criatividade a sua equipe e projetar para a próxima geração as soluções agrícolas. Michael, é um prazer te receber. You can start now. All right. Boa tarde a todos. E muito obrigado, Eleni, pela introdução. É um grande prazer estar aqui com vocês hoje. Quero começar por expressar meus sinceros agradecimentos à Universidade Federal de Pessoa e ao Grupo Gen Melhor por este convite. Vou apresentar em inglês para o webinar. Eleni, me deu permissão. Ok, so, as I was thinking about this Gen Melhor audience at UFV, And looking at your past webinars and lectures through the years, you've had some amazing opportunities to learn from industry experts about the seed industry. And it is muito legal that you have created this forum because all of you need to recognize that you hold the future of crop improvement in your hands. You are bringing your sets of technical skills and knowledge of plant genetics and breeding into academia and industry, which means that sustainable production of food, feed, fiber, and fuel in the future will rely on the innovations that you are developing. And forums like this will help you to develop a broader perspective and improve how you manage your research and breeding programs. So today, I really have no intention of talking to you about the technical details of genetics and plant breeding. Instead, I wanted to give you my thoughts on how we can evolve our ways of thinking and working together so that we are positioning ourselves to achieve this monumental task of feeding the world while also being good stewards of our planet. But before I jump into these three C's of modern crop improvement, I thought I would start by briefly introducing myself. So I was born in the Northeastern United States and my journey in plant breeding started from my very first week at university when I started working in the tomato breeding program at Pennsylvania State University. We would make manual crosses in the greenhouse shown here and then conduct field trials at our research farm off, camp off campus. And Despite the many tedious tasks, such as spending hours squishing tomato fruits to extract the seeds and, and having to smell the fermenting tomato goo in the hot greenhouse, this is really where I first fell in love with plant breeding as, as a discipline. And so I decided to pursue a career in plant breeding. And I moved a bit further to the north to Cornell University for my PhD studies, where I worked on rice genetics. And working on rice really helped me to appreciate the global nature of crop production and the importance of under, understanding where and how farmers produce their crops. That's actually me plowing a rice paddy in the Philippines with a water buffalo. After graduating, I had an amazing opportunity to join Monsanto 
in one of the most agriculturally productive places on earth in central Illinois. And I have, I had at that point never ridden on a planter or operated a combine before. So when folks tell you that most of what you learn is on the job, they are not joking. Then I began leading one of our varietal breeding organizations in North America from St. Louis. And after that, I moved to just outside Sao Paulo, Brazil, to work in our LATAM varietal breeding organization. And finally, about a year ago, I began leading our soybean product design organization at Bayer, and I'm still based in Campinas, Brazil. So that's my journey thus far, and muito obrigado for allowing me to introduce myself to you this evening. As I've been on this journey, I've worked with some of the hardest working people in the world and met some of the smartest people in the world. And while I cannot possibly summarize everything that I've learned from these people and experiences tonight, the three C's of modern crop improvement are really just a core set of principles that I think could help to orient us toward a successful future. And these principles are culture, customer, and creativity. So first, culture. As scientists, we often spend most of our energy thinking about the technical things, the complexities of genetics, experimental design, data collection, and analysis. But I will talk about the importance of grounding ourselves in a culture of intentionality and how, with this foundational mindset, we will be positioning ourselves to more effectively identify and harness innovative ideas. The second C, customer. Again, as scientists, we can sometimes lose ourselves in the science and forget that the ultimate end goal for crop improvement efforts is to enable farmers to increase crop outputs while carefully moderating the required inputs. So it's really important for all of us who are working on crop improvement in academia or in industry that we remain focused on our customers or a related C, our end consumers. I'll talk about how a customer focus affects how we design future crops, where we place our experiments and collect data, and how we need to evolve our science as our customers and our consumers change. And the last C, creativity. If we are grounded in a culture of intentionality and focused on our customers, the third principle has to do with unleashing all of your brilliant minds to reimagine how we do plant breeding. New technologies and resources to manipulate crop genomes and collect data are being invented at an ever faster pace. And we all need to be thinking disruptively about how to incorporate these innovations into our work. Okay, so if everyone's ready, buckle up and let's start with culture. And I'm going to challenge all of you with a rather big English word, serendipity. This is a word that we don't use too often in the English language. The word means the phenomenon of finding something valuable that you were not looking for. It means a pleasant surprise, an accidental discovery, a fortunate chance. And it turns out that this word is really difficult to translate into other languages, including Portuguese. Maybe the closest word in Portuguese would be acaso. But this word serendipity is relevant because many major scientific discoveries throughout history came about as happy accidents or seemingly by chance. We know that the ancient peoples in the Middle East used to store and transport milk in bladders that were made out of the stomachs of goats or other ruminant animals. And the natural rennet in these organs would have curdled the milk, leading to this discovery of queijo. A common kitchen appliance in most of our kitchens was discovered by accident by a guy working on radar technology during World War II, who noticed that the instrument he was working on was melting the candy in his pocket. And this is how the microonja was born. Someone was taking a walk one day in the Alps and was annoyed by all of the burrs sticking to his wool, wool socks and his dog's fur. So he looked closer at the burrs, and this led to the invention of Velcro. 
And we all know the story of Alexander Fleming, who came back from holiday to find mold growing on one of his petri dishes. And instead of throwing his plate into the trash, his discovery led to penicillin, the first antibiotic, a discovery that saved countless human lives. These happy accidents, they changed all of our lives in very tangible ways. I, for one, am a big fan of Cajo, although I'm pretty happy that it's no longer made in goat stomachs. Microwaved pipoca is a nice petisco. If you have kids or other young people in your life, Velcro shoes can be a lifesaver. And who knows, penicillin may have helped an ancestor in your family tree recover from a bacterial infection, which could be why you're here today. Another example of serendipity that's a lot closer to home for us working in crop improvement has to do with Norman Borlaug, whose work is credited with extensive increases in agricultural productivity that became known as the Green Revolution. We tend to think of his biggest contribution being the creation of semi-dwarf grain varieties, but one of his less appreciated but no less important discoveries was actually a happy accident. While he was working on wheat breeding in Mexico, he realized that he could speed up his breeding program by growing two cycles of field experiments per year, one in the north and one in the south in contrasting environments. This was thought to be impossible at the time due to the photoperiod sensitivity of wheat, meaning that it only flowers under short nights. But Borlaug's shuttle breeding program in Mexico led to the development of photoperiod insensitive wheat varieties that could successfully flower and produce grain in a broader range of geographies. He was just trying to get two selection seasons in a year, but serendipitously created day-length neutral wheat. A lot of really important advances in science throughout history have come about due to serendipity. If you think about the long history of crop cultivation by humans, we have been pretty darn successful at taking advantage of happy accidents, i.e. heritable genetic changes, that imparted novel features to the plant that humans were able to exploit. But if we're going to make the necessary improvements to our crop and vegetable species that are necessary to feed more humans and do so while responsibly managing our planet's natural resources and environment, we need to start turning serendipity into intentionality. This first C of culture is about ensuring that our science is hypothesis-based and that we're intentional about defining the problem that we want to solve, designing good experiments to test our hypothesis, collecting data, learning, and iterating. And as we do this, we need to prepare ourselves not uh, just to recognize and take advantage of serendipity when it happens, but actually create those lucky chances on a regular basis. We need to let go of the notion that we can or should control everything. We need to be willing to take intelligent, but not reckless risks. At Bayer Plant Breeding, we've been framing this mindset in this way. From a past state of just finding the best to actually designing the best from the start which is another way to say embracing a culture of intentionality. It was not too many years ago that we used to use the analogy that plant breeding is like finding a needle in a haystack. The plant breeder creates a whole bunch of genetic diversity, puts all of those recombinants into the field and tests them and evaluates them. And their goal is to find those precious few recombinants that are superior to what they started with. But as we think about turning serendipity into intentionality, I don't think this analogy is appropriate anymore. We could think about intentionality being that we leverage new tools and technologies to find that needle in the haystack. But I would argue that really embracing a culture of intentionality means that we need to be designing the needle from the start. Forget trying to find it in a haystack altogether. That's the key shift in thinking from finding the best to designing the best. It's up to each one of us to apply a design mindset in our daily work, to increase the frequency of happy accidents, 
to capture those unexpected moments with intentional action. If we devote ourselves to this first C, culture, we will give ourselves that space to recognize and harness those lucky chances. All right, now let's shift a little bit to our second C, customer. Crop improvement is, it's a really interesting area of science because just like any industry, we are only incentivized to do this research if there's a customer that desires something new and better than they have today. But unlike building a better, say, consumer product, like maybe a blender, um, liquidif liquidificador, liquidificador, that's a rough word in Portuguese, uh, a blender to make your fruit smoothies, where the blender will operate more or less the same, no matter which kitchen it finds itself in. Our customers are farmers who are bound by the land that they live on, the weather and the climate of their farms, the diseases and pests in their region. So it's really important for us to understand the farmers who are ultimately producing the improved crops that we are creating. What is the experience that they expect with our products on their farms? We have loads of tools in our toolbox to achieve genetic improvement of crops, but we can't just do science without considering the end result. As Steve Jobs has quoted saying, we really need to start with what our customers expect and then work backwards to design the products that meet those expectations. So what do modern farmers expect? What is the experience they desire? Well, it's useful to start by remembering that farmers expect more than just high performing seeds. They also expect a suite of crop protection options that allow them to protect their yields. And today's farmer also expects to be provided with digital insights or recommendations to help them make the best possible decisions for their farms at the right times. And when a farmer buys a variety or a hybrid bag of seed, they're really buying the genome that we intentionally design, plus any seed treatment or biological organism that's added to the seed. And as geneticists and plant breeders, we are really just focused on one part of this equation, the genome. Just like any company building a product must know the specifications of what to build, we must know our breeding goals. I know that car examples can get overused, but for a moment, just think about the process used by a car company like General Motors when they're designing a new model of the Chevy Onyx, which is the most popular car in Brazil. Before they even start designing, they need to understand what I'll call the target environment. What are their customers' preferences? What materials are available and supply chains to get those materials? Uh, what are their competitors doing, et cetera? And once they understand the goal, they can then design the specifications for all of the components, uh, the, the component parts of the car. And then they build the car. This is the 2022 model, it looks pretty spiffy. In the same way, we must understand the expectations of our customers before we really start to design improved crop genomes. What are the farmer's preferences? What soil or weather conditions are on their farms? What pathogens or pests are present? Knowing this will allow us to understand what the acceptable targets are for the final seed product. And then armed with these criteria, we can then work on designing improved varieties and hybrids. Knowing our goal is key to ensuring that we stay aligned on to, to the expectations of our customers. Another way that I like to think about this is with maybe a, a more tasty analogy, a cake. We first must understand what the customer expects the cake to look like. Is it a birthday cake or a wedding cake? What flavors and textures they want? What icing and toppings do they desire? This is the product concept. It's what the customer expects. And once we know those expectations, we can then design sort of the recipe, the, 
that allows us to achieve that product concept. The recipe would contain the necessary ingredients, cooking temperature and time, what order to mix everything together. This is like our selection indices, which are in plant breeding, selection indices are the mathematical formulas that we use to drive our selection decisions. Now, whether we're talking about cars or cakes, the point is that if we take this second C seriously, we need to know the customer's expectations of the final product before we can start designing that product. Now, assuming that we know the customer's expectations and remembering that the part of the customer's experience that we in plant breeding can affect is the genome, the next thing is to remember that our recipe is not quite as easy as a cake recipe, right? It's not like we can just add a dash of canela or easily switch from chocolate to vanilla icing. The genome is a complex biological system. And the genomes of our crop species also don't exist in a vacuum. They are affected by both internal and external factors. Internal factors like physical linkage between gene, genes on chromosomes, epistatic interactions between unlinked genes, and genotype by transgene interactions. And there are also external factors, such as genome interactions with the environment or with the farmer's management practices. In order to design for our customers, we need to be aware of and plan to account for these factors in our crop improvement programs. As I mentioned, the genome is a complex system. And while we're discovering new and exciting ways to manipulate our crop genomes, we still have to manage some key unavoidable challenges. If we think about our products as genomes and not just a collection of genes, we realize that there's a lot of work to do to improve our ability to manipulate the genome holistically. One feature that we need to figure out is how to better manage this pesky little thing called linkage. Physical linkage means that we just we can't just put all of the genomic loci that control the traits we're interested in together like Lego blocks. Let's say that I gave you a bucket of Lego blocks like this and, and asked you to build a house or build a, a Lego castle. You would probably have no trouble, right? Muito facil, né? But now imagine that you're trying to build your Lego castle if all the pieces were stuck together on a string. You would likely find that this is a lot more challenging because that's the situation that we have when we're managing our crop genomes. Chromosomes are like strings of genes that are physically connected. And this affects everything from how we leverage genomic selection, how we increase the frequency of favorable native alleles, and how we integress transgenic events. We also know that genes do not exist in a vacuum. Their expression is almost always dependent on other genes. There are additive and dominance effects. There are pleiotropic and epistatic interactions between genes. There are complex biosynthetic pathways. There are also non-genic factors that affect expression, such as promoters and suppressors. And all of these effects and interactions together are what control the manifestation of the traits that our customers care about. It's important to focus our energy on understanding the genetic architecture of traits that have value. This will not only allow us to account for this architecture in our genomic selection criteria or our, our selection models, but it will also allow us to be smarter about what genes we target for gene editing uh, or how we integress transgenic events. Uh, in addition to internal factors, our crop genomes are almost always affected by external stimuli, such as environmental factors and management practices. We must take these factors into account when designing our experiments to ensure that we're collecting data that is relevant to our customers' farms. What are their crop rotation patterns? How much fertilizer do they apply? How much rain do they get? What is their planting density? We must grow our experiments where and how our customers grow. And when we make the effort to understand the practices of our customers, we may discover patterns where 
maybe we are planting our field trials outside the main window of time that our farmers are planting. Or we may discover that our field trials in a certain region are planted at a different planting density than what our farmers are using. These are key insights that will help us to alter our experiments to be more customer focused. My final thoughts on being customer focused are that we must also always have our eyes on the future. We need to make sure that we're staying ahead of the trends that are shifting and changing the agricultural landscape around the world. We are breeding for crops that are resistant to pests, pathogens, and working to control weeds. But we know that just as fast as we are evolving new ways to manage these threats, the pests, pathogens, and weeds are evolving as well. And it's crucial for us to be continuously innovating if we want to keep this, if we want to keep winning this evolutionary battle. As I mentioned earlier, we need to be focusing on our customers, but we also need to be keeping our fingers on the pulse of consumer trends. We know that societal trends are shifting what people eat and how they expect their food to be produced and marketed to them. In some parts of the world, meat consumption is increasing as the middle class grows in size. In other countries, even right here in Brazil, meat consumption is actually flat or decreasing. And this is due to consumers shifting their diets toward more plant-based food products and alternative protein sources. I bet a few of you out there own or know someone who owns a hybrid or an electric vehicle. So the demand for traditional fuels is changing and alternative energy sources are becoming more important. We can't ignore the impacts that these societal trends are gonna have on agriculture. We need to pay attention to them and as our farmer customers shift their practices to align with consumer demand, we need to be prepared to shift how we do crop improvement research accordingly. And one last big change to the global agricultural landscape has to do with climate change. More extreme weather patterns are increasing in frequency and intensity. Agricultural production is becoming more challenging in many parts of the world, forcing in some cases, human populations to change how they grow their crops or even what crops they grow. In other cases, like I'm showing here, the warming climate is opening up vast new parts of the earth to agricultural production. Farmers in Western Canada are choosing to plant corn and soybeans in new areas as the, day, as the length of the growing season is now long enough to grow these crops in Northern areas that would never have typically been able to because there, the season was too short between killing frosts. Perhaps this New York Times article from last year was a bit over the top, but it does make you think. We really need to be evolving our crop improvement efforts in lockstep with the evolving climate. All right, so now that we've talked about building a culture of intentionality and focusing on our customer, these first two C's are really foundational principles meant to ensure that we are orienting our efforts toward designing products that meet expectations of our customers. The final C is creativity. And this is the really fun part because this is where we really get to break all of the rules. In Brazil, one of my favorite expressions is as regras now exist. And I say this because agriculture like almost every industry today is embracing new technologies at a faster and faster pace. This means that our crop improvement strategies must be disruptive. We should, and in fact, we must challenge the status quo. We need to shift our minds from incremental innovation to truly seeking disruptive innovations because incremental progress isn't good enough. Incremental progress is doing just enough to stay in the game. Let's use the example of Walkmans back in the 1990s. These were portable electronic devices that allowed people to listen to music on the go. Companies made small changes to the Walkman over time, evolving from a cassette tape player to a CD player to a mini disc player. But none of these changes were really disruptive. 
But then Apple came along and invented the iPod. And this was really a game changer. That Apple recognized that digital music was the future. And they invented a, a way for people to carry around digital music without needing tapes or CDs or other media. My point is, we need to be incorporating new equipment, advances in engineering, information technology, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. We need to be leveraging the latest advances in genomics, phenomics, and envirotyping if we are going to be disruptive and change the game. And that means that the technical skills required to conduct cutting edge plant breeding research are changing as well. It's not just geneticists and field breeders anymore. We will need the help of electrical and mechanical engineers, experts with imaging and remote sensing, operations research analysts, computer scientists, statisticians and bio, uh, computational biologists, and folks who can help us build advanced algorithms that can incorporate all of our data to make the best decisions. Changing the game requires disruptive thinking, which often but not always means moving from some current state of thinking or working to some new or desired state. And I'd like to share some examples of where this is happening today in Bayer Crop Science and other crop improvement institutions around the world, including right here in Brazil. First, we've been doing the initial stages of the breeding process, such as making crosses and inbreeding in the field for many decades. And when you execute these processes in the field, you're, you're, dealing, you're at the mercy of mother nature, which leads to inherent inefficiencies and failures. But by moving these processes from the field to controlled environments, we can drastically improve the efficiency of these operations while also drastically reducing the amount of land area, water, fertilizer, and fuel required to grow the plants, meaning a better result for our scientists and much less impact on the environment. Also, whereas in the past we had to plant each unique, unique genotype out into the field in replicated trials to understand its performance, uh, you know, the potential of each, of each genotype. Today, a suite of technologies allows us to do this first selection step in the lab instead of in the field. A combination of decades of phenotypic data on our germplasm, new lab technologies like seed chipping, new genotyping technologies with higher marker density and throughput, and advances in genomic prediction models have converged to enable us to take a little piece out of each seed and understand its performance potential before we ever plant it in the ground. Today, we can obtain the same amount of information from a five centimeter by five centimeter genotyping chip, genotyping array, that it would have taken us over five hectares of field testing to obtain in the past. All right, so we know that there have been massive improvements in equipment and automation in recent times. And we must be taking advantage of these innovations in our crop improvement programs to shift from manual operations to more automated operations. This first example is how we packaged seed when I was a corn breeder back in Illinois. A crew of folks had to scan each source seed package, print the, pack, the planting packets, and then use individual counting machines to count the seed into planting packets. It was laborious, it was time consuming, and every researcher had to pretty much prepare their own research. Today, with new advances in robotics, we have the potential to shift seed packaging uh, uh, and planting preparation into a centralized system, utilizing warehouse-sized robotic facilities that can precisely move seed sources count out the appropriate amount for each experiment type, and then load that seed into the exact position in cassettes that will then go to the field for planting. Speaking of cassette planting, the photo on the left is a photo that I took probably 10 years ago when we were planting my corn nursery in the spring. New planting technologies coupled with the automated cassette filling that I showed above 
are enabling us to plant our research trials more precisely than ever before, where we can literally geospatially track the placement of every seed. All right, plant breeders have traditionally relied on their eyes to you know, take uh, data from, the from field trials. And I will say as a plant breeder myself, I can say that you should never underestimate the power of a breeder's eyes. But that said, I also recognize that my eyes can't see everything. And I certainly can't be as efficient as some of the new imaging technologies that exist today. We used to have to, you know, in this example, uh, we had to ask groups of people, researchers, to visit field trials to identify plots that had poor germination or lacked uniformity. And that was so that we could deactivate these plots and they wouldn't uh, impact our data. Now with unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, we can collect images from the air and use machine learning approaches to detect plots with unacceptable uniformity. Similarly, Instead of researchers walking through fields to collect maturity data during the, the sort of pre-harvest season, we can fly UAVs over fields at multiple time points throughout the maturation period, allowing us to estimate the maturity of each plot much more precisely. We've built our phenotyping strategies in the past to collect data on the terminal traits of interest, like grain yield. But we also know that traits like yield are fairly low heritability traits that are hard to measure and lack repeatability. What if we could measure traits that are easier to measure and perhaps even cheaper or more accurate, and then use them as a proxy for the terminal traits of interest? An example actually from dairy cattle is mastitis. Mastitis is a common and costly inflammation of the udder leading to breeders to select for mastitis resistance. Clinical mastitis is really difficult to measure and it has low heritability. But researchers discovered that the level or the amount of somatic cells in the milk was a much better way to predict mastitis and it was a, a lot easier to measure. We have the opportunity to be creative and look for ways to collect component or intermediate traits in our crop species that can inform the terminal traits that our farmers care about. And we also have the opportunity to continuously be evaluating and improving how we measure our phenotypes to improve accuracy and repeatability. Shifting gears a bit to think about how we use data to make decisions in any crop improvement program. If we want to apply disruptive thinking we're going to need to move away from being dogma-driven to being fully data-driven. Maybe you will encounter folks who are hesitant to change a process that's, that's been reliable for many years, or maybe someone will advise you to just go with your gut. While sometimes we do need to trust our instincts, we have the tools today to ensure that data is playing a central role in all of our decision-making. This goes back to what I talked about earlier under culture. Unlike any time before in history, we have the ability to actually design the needle instead of looking for a needle in a haystack. Let's not squander this opportunity by failing to use the data that we have to the fullest of its potential. <laughs> All right, how many of us out there are still using elaborate spreadsheets to store data and make calculations? I'll be honest, I'm still guilty of this myself. But as we think about the sheer volumes of data that we're collecting today, we realize that it is really impossible to keep relying on static tools like spreadsheets to efficiently manage our data and connect our data and to our analytics platforms. We need to continue to move toward utilizing machine learning approaches in crop improvement programs because the data sets are just getting too big for the human mind and an Excel spreadsheet to handle. For example, if we look across all of our unique germplasm entities at Bayer Crop Science and just pencil out some rough math, you quickly realize that there are more than 5,000 times more genetic combinations possible than known stars in the universe. And last I checked, the number of stars is pretty high, and we obviously can't make all of those crosses. 
machine learning opens us up to gaining insights and making connections that we may have never thought of. For example, online dating websites. They're not terribly popular in Brazil right now, but Tinder and Brazil Cupid do seem to be catching on. And similar dating websites in the United States with much larger sample sizes have demonstrated significantly lower divorce rates between couples who met on these sites compared to the national average. So it's just one example of how machine learning may make connections that we may have never found otherwise. One potential fallacy in modern crop improvement is that we must do more or be bigger to achieve our goals. More equipment, more test plots, more greenhouses, more lab samples. But the reality is that we don't always have to go bigger, but we do need to go smarter. Any successful crop improvement program of the future is going to depend on balancing these three things, speed, accuracy, and efficiency. And this may mean that sometimes collecting high quality data is more important than collecting more data. I think we've all heard the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. Going smarter means that we focus more energy on balancing the various needs of, of our breeding programs to collect the highest quality data as fast as we can and for the lowest possible cost. And just one last thing under creativity, one last to from state for you to ponder. For most plant breeding programs throughout history, the main objective has been to maximize one thing, yield. And there was a good reason for this. We humans were trying to find ways to increase crop productivity to feed a rapidly growing human population. But this focus on performance alone may not be the best way to optimize our selection strategies. What if in certain environments, a certain disease could wipe out the crop regardless of its yield potential? Or what if you plant a variety with huge yield potential, but it cannot mature before the first killing frost? Or what if you have to spray chemicals on your fields seven times throughout the season to control pests or pathogens, but having just a genetic source of resistance may be able to cut that number of sprays in half? The point harkens back to our second C of customer. Maybe instead of focusing only on yield performance, we should tailor our crop improvement efforts to enable the highest possible return on investment for our farmers. Okay, woo. Hopefully I was able to keep you all awake during this evening webinar. As I said at the beginning, my hope was that I could impart some thoughts on how we can evolve our ways of thinking and working together toward gen mayor of crops. I talked about these three C's of modern crop improvement, which really, as I said, are just principles meant to orient us toward the future. And these are just three C's. There are certainly more C's and maybe even more other letters that we should be considering as well. My greatest hope is that each of you will be thinking about how you can transform serendipity into intentionality and create a research culture that is primed to recognize fortunate chances when they appear. Let's design the, the needle and forget about the haystack. I challenge you to always remain focused on your customers understand the cake that they desire, and then design a recipe that results in the best cake they've ever tasted. And I know each and every one of you brings your unique talents and skills to the table. Use your creativity to think disruptively. Don't just settle for staying in the game, but strive to change the game. You are in a position to drive crop improvement in ways that our predecessors never would have dreamed were possible. And future generations of humans on our planet are depending on you. Muito obrigado novamente por esta oportunidade para falar com o Grupo Gen Mayor. Se vocês tiverem alguma dúvida ou ideia que gostaria de compartilhar comigo, meu uh, Bayer email está aqui. Tenho LinkedIn e Twitter também. Por favor, me contacto. Estou animado por isso. 
Obrigado de novo. Vou receber suas perguntas agora. Excelente, Michael. Nós temos aqui a pergunta do Diego Machado. Ele quer saber quais são os desafios para aplicar os três Cs em seu trabalho. Um, I, I think one of the challenges is uh, uh, just making sure that we have the resources and the the research money to do the, the work that we need to do. But also, we're dealing in agriculture with a very, you know, there are situations that we just can't control. For example, if a if a hurricane hits one of the sites where we have our operations and wipes out a, a crop, I mean, that's not something that we can control. So that's why, as we think about, uh, you know, culture, customer, and creativity, it really comes down to also, uh, maybe this is another letter that we didn't have, but flexibility, agility. We need to uh, make sure that we have flexibility in our research and breeding programs if we're going to be successful and be able to, uh, you know, apply creativity in all that we do. Isso. Ele perguntou também sobre é, como desenvolver esse lado criativo para aprimorar, aprimorar né, a ciência de culturas sustentáveis. É uma boa pergunta. Eu acho que o que eu diria é que it comes kind of down to that to from state of, of questioning or, or uh, not just settling for the way that things have al always been done. Um, we've achieved amazing advances in crop productivity by uh, both by doing genetic improvement of crops, but also through management practices. Um, but there are cases where that's actually given us a bit of a crutch and allowed us to do things inefficiently like put down lots and lots of fertilizer, but then a lot of that fertilizer gets leached into the soil and lost, or um, even with uh, controlling weeds. You know, when glyphosate re resistant uh, crops first came out, it was super easy for farmers to just go out and, and spray glyphosate and it took care of weeds. And we had a prosperous decade where it was just really easy to control weeds. But it wasn't a matter of if, but when weeds developed resistance. And now it's, it's much more difficult to control weeds. So what it comes down to is being responsible about our research. So for example, with pest, uh, controlling pests, right? So we have uh, BT technology, right? We have different ways of, uh, through transgenic technologies, controlling pests in our crop species. But in order to, to really think about sustainable crop production, we need to make sure that we have multiple modes of action in our, in our crop species so that we can greatly delay the, uh, the, the development of resistance by the insect uh, and pests. That will allow us to delay having to go back to spraying dangerous chemicals in, in our agricultural production. Excellent, Michael. Uh, aqui nós, deixa eu abrir a pergunta. O Odimar Almeida pergunta: como manter tantos funcionários alinhados uh, nesses três Cs? It's a good question. I guess it, it really starts with each one of us taking the the personal responsibility to live and influence our colleagues, right, with these principles. Um, but it also really, I would say, requires us to think differently about how we interact with each other, with, with our peers, with our reports, with our leaders, our bosses, right? Um, sort of that top-down approach is not a really good way to be aligned to these three Cs, right? It really requires um, more of a, a, a team of teams approach where uh, folks are able to uh, feel empowered to notice and speak 
what they're, what they're seeing across all of the levels of the organization. So really a bottom up approach where all of the employees, all of the scientists are, are encouraged to observe, you know, take, uh, uh, do their experiments, make their observations, and then feel free to talk about those observations uh, with their colleagues and their leaders is really important to making sure that everyone stays aligned to these principles. Oh, you're on mute, Delaney. É, a Ana Letícia agradece a palestra e ela quer saber, do lado do cliente, né? Pensando como cliente, como nós prevemos essas expectativas de longo prazo? Yeah, this is really important. And, you know, none of us have a crystal ball that we can see the future. But what's really important is for us to, again, if we're being data driven, we need to be collecting data that tells us what our farmers are doing and how they're changing over time. Um, and so, uh, you know, at Bayer Crop Science, we have our climate field view. And this is allowing us to really uh, uh, understand what farmers are doing and maybe how their practices are changing. And that gives us clues to tell us what we need to be uh, expecting and how we need to be changing our research to adapt to, those, to the future. An example might be uh, if farmers in a certain region uh, start planting on 20 inch rows instead of 30 inch rows. And if we start to see that trend happening, then we know that we have to change our research uh, experiments to match what the farmers are doing. Um, in terms of climate change, you know, we know with more extreme weather events that things like drought tolerance and maybe even flooding tolerance are, are going to be more important into the future, right? And so we can anticipate that and build that into uh, our research and breeding programs. Muito obrigada, Michael. É, a sua palestra ela foi, sem dúvida, muito esclarecedora. Tivemos muito aprendizados. E agora vamos partir para a pergunta do Edilson. Edilson. E aqui. Pode ficar à vontade para responder, Michael. Eu não encontrei aqui. Ah, desculpe. Eu não ouvi a, uh, ouvi a pergunta. É, colocamos na tela para você, Michael. Deixa eu achar aqui. Acho que eu vi a, a, a pergunta about are we are these three C's these principles being applied today or is this something more for the future? And and uh, this was the question by Edison Marcus. Um, I would say that uh, we're absolutely applying these principles today. And uh, as I kind of alluded to, I mean, the ability to um, stay ahead of the changes that are happening. Uh, to global agriculture sort of requires us to be applying these principles today. But I also think that uh, for you as, you, as you move into your careers in, in academia or in industry, um, it's going to be really important for you to, to, to carry this on and to ensure that these principles are being applied in, in your research programs. It's, I think maybe the answer is it can be both. We need to be doing this today, and I would hope that we continue to do this into the future. A pergunta do Jean agora, ele quer saber como nós podemos influenciar, né, mudar a opinião dos clientes que pensam 
que melhoramento de plantas é apenas uma ciência de plantas transgênicas. É porque a gente, aqui no Brasil, né, nós ainda enfrentamos essa, essa realidade. Né? Então, como fazer essa mudança de mentalidade? Sim. So, obviously, we, we need both, right? We need to continue to drive the overall performance improvements in our crop species through plant breeding techniques. But the, the transgenic technologies are also important because actually from a sustainability perspective, they're crucial uh, to being able to reduce or eliminate uh, the use of, of chemicals um, or, or to, to help us use more sustainable management practices like no-till. Um, so we really need both. Um, and I would say maybe as an answer that I didn't really go into the technical details today, but I mentioned gene editing, right? So gene editing is, is, a, is a technology that allows us to make very precise changes to the DNA at the nucleotide level. It allows us to change a nucleotide. It allows us to uh, insert a, a, a piece of DNA at a very exact location, or it allows us to remove a piece of DNA at a very exact location. And this technology offers a lot of promise because it, it you know, in the future, it could allow us to uh, create new traits that are not transgenic, right? That are really just a, a, a very precise manipulation of the organism's own DNA. Um, and at least from a regulatory perspective and, and just from a genetics perspective, um, this is not the same thing as inserting a transgene, right? And um, I think it's really important for all of us to be advocates and to go out and make sure that we are talking with our, our friends, our families, our neighbors, about the work that we do, about the safety of the products that, that we are working on, uh, so that people can start to, to internalize that and realize that um, these technologies are really good for farmers they're, and they're really good for the planet. O Pedro Brandão, ele te parabeniza, Michael. A palestra foi incrível. E em sua visão, que perspectivas nós podemos esperar sobre o uso é, desses três Cs no futuro? As I said, I, I, I really think that, um, you know, as we go into the future, uh, and like I said, these, these principles of culture, customer, and creativity, uh, it's not maybe everything that we need to be considering, but these are, these are just meant to kind of point us in the right direction. Um, as we go into the future, you know, that last one about creativity, um, you as, as students, as graduate students, as undergrads have this, you're learning, right? You're, you're, you're learning in classes, you're learning by doing, you're doing work in the lab, you're doing work in the field. Um, and when you're being taught, you're being taught a certain way of doing something. Um, if, these, if this principle of creativity is really gonna work, then you need to really take the, what you're learning and go one step further and think about other possibilities, right? How did Apple come up with the idea of the iPod and do it way many years before other competitors thought about it, right? Challenge yourself to think that way, to think about you know, a, a different way of doing something that might seem totally crazy, but then start to, you know, start out with a skeleton and start to put some things on the bones and start to work out your idea, build some experiments to test it. And you might find that your crazy idea isn't so crazy after all. And maybe your crazy idea could be the iPod, the next iPod of, uh, of plant breeding. Perfeito, Michael. Alice, ela quer saber quais são as principais competências em que devemos estar focados para nos prepararmos para os desafios no mercado e aplicar esses três Cs na nossa carreira profissional. So, I think it's really important to be grounded in, you know, the 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 uh, the discipline of genetics, uh, of breeding. But really for the, the next generation of scientists that I think are going to really uh, be excelling in these three C's are scientists that are also, um, you know, 
bringing additional skill sets like um, having a familiarity with data science, being able to manage large data sets. Um, probably some some basic programming skills would be useful because again, we're we're dealing with data that's far too large to to hold in Excel spreadsheets, right? And so the ability to be able to uh, manipulate that data to uh, build analytics models that can can utilize that data to help us make better decisions. Those are key skill sets. Also, I would say I mentioned all earlier about the different technical skills that we'll need. Um, it, we we we're collecting phenotypic data in new and different ways, right? So if you have the opportunity to think outside the box with how you collect your data in the field, is there a way that we can collect data under the ground? We're, get, we're getting really good at collecting images above the field, but there's a whole bunch of plant below the, below the soil surface, right? How can we start to understand what's going on under the soil surface? And not just with the roots of the plant, but with pathogens and other microbes that live in the soil. Um, so people that bring those skill sets, which are more on the engineering side, more on the data science or, or the information technology side, um, those are skill sets that I think will be useful for scientists in this field in the future. O Daniel Silva te parabeniza mais uma vez, Michael. E qual seria a sua recomendação para o aluno que sai sem ter esse contato tão grande com essas tecnologias? Aproveitando, ele também pergunta se existem vagas para trainees e doutores, para trainees como doutores e mestres, além dos profissionais recém-formados. As I mentioned, uh, uh... Most of learning comes from learning on the job. So don't be concerned if you don't necessarily have access to or have experience with a certain technology during your, your training. Um, you'll learn and you'll learn fast uh, on the job. And with that said, uh, at Bayer Crop Science, we, we, every year uh, we have opportunities for both interns and co-ops to, to join us for a period of time Uh, to take on a very targeted project and really uh, learn not just the science of that project itself, but what it's like to be a, at, a, at a company uh, like Bayer and, and to work within an organization that's fairly large um, and it's global, right? So really you get the opportunity to, to meet fellow interns and fellow co-ops from around the world, which is a really cool experience. And I can point you to our webs our, our, our intern and co-op website. Uh, maybe I'll send that along to the our Gen Mayor uh, hosts. Excelente. O Adriel, ele quer saber a sua opinião. Já existe alguma mudança importante na necessidade dos clientes quando falamos em melhoria de safra para o produto para um futuro próximo? I think so. So, I, and I kind of alluded to this and, and I've been using that term sustainability, right? So farmers, uh, consumers are expecting their food to be grown in a responsible way. Consumers are increasingly asking for proof that there's a way that their food, that, that, that they know where their food came from and that they know it was produced in a, in a responsible way. And so farmers are having to adapt to that, right? Um, and so I really do think that a, a big trend that we're going to see and a place that crop improvement efforts need to make sure we're stay keeping up with is how are we, if farmers are say uh, doing no-till, doing no-till on their fields so that, and uh, really being, Uh, very intentional about the amount of fertilizer that they put down. Uh, and they therefore get a premium on their, on their product because a processor is willing to pay more for uh, the, the grain or the, the produce that was produced a certain responsible or sustainable way. Um, what does that mean for crop improvement? That means that, okay, in a no-till environment, we need to have seeds that can germinate more vigorously to go through that crop residue. We might need to think about 
more sources of disease resistance because now you're not tilling up the field and there might be diseases or pests that remain in the soil. Um, there's all kinds of things that we can think about that we need to be ahead of if we're going to be producing improved uh, crops, improved uh, varieties and hybrids for farmers to grow in that in a world where consumers are demanding more sustainably produced products. Muito obrigada, Michael, mais uma vez. É, fico muito feliz em você dividir conosco o seu tempo, dividir o seu conhecimento para agregar na vida profissional de cada um de nós que estamos acompanhando. Em nome do Gei Melhor, eu agradeço pela sua participação e ficamos à sua disposição. É, Michael, nós temos uma pergunta do Igor aqui também. Antes de finalizarmos, é, você gostaria de respondê-la? Se tivermos um tempinho ainda. Ah, sim, sim. Eu vi. Uh, so, <laughs> it's an interesting, it's like the question is about, um, you know, there's, there's this impression that, that, we, that, that these technologies are in places like the United States. And so a lot of students uh, uh, have this desire to go and, and learn or, or go to the United States to learn. Why did, why did I come to Brazil? Um, I will say that these technologies are everything I described today is in use here in Brazil. Um, and we're, we're ramping up quickly to, to, to do plant breeding and, and do crop improvements with these new technologies here in Brazil. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that there's, there's not really a, uh, you don't need to, to, to go to another country to learn and be, become very well trained. In fact, I'm going through you know, a hiring process right now for scientists. And I'll be, I'm not pandering, I'm being quite honest that the, the candidates that we're encountering here in Brazil are, I would, in my opinion, are stronger in many cases than candidates in the, coming from universities in the United States. And that's, that's not kidding at all. So I've been just so impressed by um, the, the caliber, the quality of the scientists that are coming out of programs like U, UFFA. Um, how do I like Brazil? I love Brazil. And I, I'll stay here until Bayer tells me I can't stay here any longer. Ficamos muito felizes que você esteja gostando, Michael. E com isso, nós finalizamos agora o nosso quarto webinar. Espero que todos tenham gostado e continue conosco acompanhando a programação do Gei Melhor e os próximos eventos. Muito obrigada! <música>